Hi, I'm Mark Malkoff, and we are at the world famous Comedy Cellar, and I have the distinct privilege, and I'm not only saying that because I'm getting paid lots of money, to interview one of the funniest men I know, comedy writers, comedians, and that man is Tom Leopold. Thanks, Mark. I am that man. That's why I've consented to come into this very dank room and be interviewed by a guy who wouldn't even have the courtesy to shave. That's and I true. You know what I do? I respect it in a way that go, you know, go to hell attitude of yours, and I'm looking forward yeah. to be interviewed by that. Yes. I really think a, a, a lot of times a reflection of, of somebody's career and their ability is, is what their, their peers have to say. Christopher Guest, uh, Harry Shear, Paul Shea, for some of the most funny, talented people, Chevy Chase, were here. It's just these are some of the hardest people to, to make laugh. And they've all been your friend over the decades. And you know, maybe I, that's why I can make them laugh. They just <laughs> feel so warmly towards me. <laughs> I remember talking to Chevy, and and he told me about how the first time that you guys actually met, he had heard something that you had said. I yeah. believe I've known Chris Guest and his sister since I'm 17. So I knew Alyssa Guest since she was 14. And and uh, I was doing this play in Boston. I had an apartment, and she said, "Hey, I want to come see your show." And I said, "Great, come." Man. Can I stay with you? Sure. Okay, I'll stay two or three days. And I said, stay two. <laughs> and I, I, I was okay. I didn't think it was that funny. But then a, like a week later, I get a call from Chevy Chase, who had just became the biggest star in the country. I mean, it was the first year of Saturday Night Live. And I was sitting on a chair, on a couch, and he came over. I hadn't really known him, just to say hello. He came out of the couch, and uh, now this is terribly boastful, but it's an interview about me. Who else am I, who else am I gonna brag about? Um, he just sat down and he said, um, I hear you're the funniest guy. And I just went, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so he calls me up and he, and he says, they just gave me a big TV special on NBC. I want you to write for it, but I only want you to write for it <clears throat> if what I heard you say, you said. And I said, what was that? You know? And said, the thing about stay two. And I said, yeah, uh, yeah. And he said, okay, well, I want you to write on the show. Anyway, I did, and it was great. And, that, um, and then you were working out of NBC Burbank? Was that where you guys did no, the No, we did it. It was for NBC, but we did it out on Sunset Boulevard at KTLA. The great thing about where we were was the, uh, that the Liars Club was over there shooting, mm. and some other terrible <laughs> shows were shooting. So I just said, who would like to meet Chevy Chase? Oh, and they got all excited. And it was like, 150 of them, 200 of them. And I said, come on. And we walked this huge line, <laughs> like the death march over to the office. And up. And I walk in, and I open the door. I just said, Jeff, he's talking to his manager. A couple of people want to meet you. Is that OK? And that's not the time. And, and Chevy knew I was up to something. <laughs> and Chevy, the great thing about him is that anything could go by the wayside. If there's a bit, the manager can wait. You know. Okay. I said, oh, God bless you, Jeff. And I bring in these people, Chip and Chase, one after another. And it was like the clowns getting out of the car, you know, all the clowns. And that went on for like 18 minutes. And, and he just played it straight. He, could, he was just laughing his ass off. I don't know. That was funny. It was one of my nice memories. You've had such an incredible career. You did Is it over? Chevy. I think so. I think oh. it's over. And scene. You did the Chevy specials. Couldn't freeze it. Print it. I, I have to ask you about working on, on Seinfeld. It's, sure. What was your, can you talk about maybe one of your episodes that you wrote and the process of, of writing it? Because it was very different. It, most shows, like when you wrote it, Cheers, you're around a table, but it wasn't right. like that at not Seinfeld. Not at all, no. <clears throat> I'd rather not talk about it. <laughs> Here's the whole thing. Um, one of my favorite shows is The Cafe that I wrote. Um, oh, yeah about Babu Bhatt, you're a bad man, Jerry, all that. I told Larry the story about this little cafe that was on the corner of our, my wife and I, our apartment on, on West 11th Street in Waverly. And it was just like the tiniest little uh, restaurant, like four tables in it, tiny. But the menu was, it was called the Dream Cafe. One day it just opened up like the next building down from us, the Dream Cafe. And the thing is, four tables, but the menu was, Chinese food, Indian food, 
I mean, <laughs> American food. It's like just desperate to get anybody to come in. And this little guy who was Vietnamese, it's not like Indian like we had Babu Bab, he wore the same thing every day. It was a madras shirt. But at night, he put two tables out and put candles on them. So I came, she, took my wife. She said, well, we should go in. I said, no, we go in. We'll always have to go in. It'll be so horrible. That was the A story. And the B story was, years and years ago, I dated a girl that, a woman, you could call actresses actors, but you can't call gr women girls. I learned something. Okay, just yeah. remember, I don't, get, I, will remember. I don't want you to get in trouble. Thank you, sir. Okay. So you were, you were dating somebody. Oh, yeah, and she gave, her job was to give IQ tests. And, uh, and she kept saying, well, I'll give you an IQ test. And I said, I want, I, I was afraid of it. Because <laughs> I mean, fine, I'm even stupider than I think I am, right? <laughs> but anyway, I thought that would be good if George got an IQ test. Mm -hmm. So those two stories, and that's how Larry would do it. He, he, he was brilliant. He kept a notebook with little things that happened. And when he needed some little B story, he'd go, oh, yeah, hey, that guy in the bus. I can make, you know, I learned a lot from it. And, uh, and that's a lot of people say, you know, Babu Bhatt goes, you're a bad man, Jerry. <laughs> Jerry goes in and, and uh, gives him advice and it ruins his whole restaurant. And so, yeah. You worked with Steve Allen. And you, you look at Steve Allen's I career. Love Steve Allen. And, you know, he was really one of the guys, the first guys to do it with the desk. Dave Letterman has acknowledged He was that. my generation's yeah. Letterman yeah, yeah, yeah. when I was a kid. <clears throat> and a lot of what Dave was doing on the NBC show, he acknowledged he, with Steve Allen. Yeah. So you work with him, and Steve Allen had, <clears throat> had did he have like a bandit? He had like a, sh yeah. a small cut? Yeah, first of all, I idolized Steve Allen. Yeah. And I idolized him because I never, uh, what intrigued me about him was how fast he was. Mm -hmm. Like, he could just, and he was so fast, he was so humor, his humor, he could, say great stuff like bam just like that some of it i realized was programmed but a lot of it wasn't so i get this job writing for steve and we're on location at a movie like a movie theater outside a movie theater i wrote some sketch that took place in the movie theater, and i hadn't really met him and the crew was setting up and we're both standing together outside this movie house and steve was really tall he was like came to about there on me and i looked up and he had like a round band-aid on his neck you know, for cut himself shaving or a pimple or something. And I'm standing, this is my God, you know, he's a God to me, right? And I'm just standing there next to him. And then finally, for some reason, I had, I, I went to his, I took my finger and pressed it on the Band-Aid like that and held it there like that a long time. And I said, Gwen, bring my car around and tell, <laughs> tell Tony down at the barber shop. I just want a little, a little. And I left it a long time. He went nuts. He laughed so hard. And... From then on, I was like, he put me on the show <clears throat> with Catherine O'Hara. Catherine O'Hara was a writer on it, too. Oh. And uh, we both ended up acting and singing and dancing. And I, had sketch I was in sketches with Lucille Ball. And I was in sketches with Steve and Louis Nye. And, and uh, I look back on that, and I go, where did that come from? Uh, how could I? I'm, I'm so glad I did do it. But I guess. It, as, as scary as it might have been, I wanted so much to connect with him, obviously. I look back on it now like, I mean, that's a ballsy thing to do, you know, or a stupid thing to do. I could have been fired I was, the first day, you know. I was at an event. Harry Shearer was the guest. And I've met Harry a, a few times. Always been very, very nice to me. They did a Q&A. He's never been nice to me. <laughs> I've there, known him for 40 years. There was a Q&A, and somebody asked him, who is the funniest person you know? And without missing a beat, he said, Tom Leopold. Wow. That was his answer. And he gave a bunch of your credits. And sitting there, being your friend, and I've known you for a long time, just the, the biggest grin uh, on my face, well, just heart. I'll tell you something about those guys. Um, I've written a lot with Harry. We've had some great times. And he's a dear, great friend. And nobody makes me laugh. Nobody makes me laugh like those guys. And I guess hopefully I make them laugh because it's not everybody can be on a certain level. It's like musicians, right? Mm -hmm. Like when we're together, it's just, mm -hmm. I come out like bouncing off the walls because he's so good, he's so good, he's so good. And maybe I get lucky with a joke, you know, whatever. Yeah. My first day of school, I met these two guys, Christopher Guest and Michael McKean. <clears throat> we were in acting school together. Now they were two years older. They were 19, I was seven, they'd gone to college. So that's a big difference kind of then. But I had no idea how maybe funny I had gotten. Never thought about it until I met them 
and thought, these guys are laughing at me, and they're the funny, these guys are the funniest people imaginable. I wanna, they laughed at me, so I thought, hey, I might, and that gave me a big thing of confidence. I, so <laughs> you're 17 years old in an yeah. acting class, and yeah. that's when the comedy thing kind of, it, it, it clicks Except we were all there to be actors, serious actors, you know. And we were all funny, and we took a lot of crap. I was, we had this acting teacher, and uh, he went around the room after he, his tenure was up. We had like six weeks of different teachers. And he came and went around the room, went about everybody, says, you'll end up doing maybe Iago in uh, repertory in Canada. You'll, you'll probably end up off Broadway. You'll be in the movies. And he got to me, and he says, oh, Tama, you may be in a sitcom or something. And that hurt my feelings. Now, now I would love it, but I mean, everybody else was going to be getting, you know, the Olivier Award, and I'm going to be Uncle Jim on the Waltons or whatever. Now, multicam shows are very, very tricky to, to make work, to make funny, and to be funny decades later. Cheers, which you were a writer on, had that. Well, it's all about how funny they're, it's all about the characters. And if you've got great characters and you're funny, you can put funny lines in their mouth, it's great. The cast respected us, respected the writers. That was all built in when I got there. And that was, the, that was a show that, where the writers really in, talked about, the, the actors talked about the writers in interviews. And I've never had that experience again where actors ever mentioned the writers. So Cheers was a very great experience. Who are some of the other people that young Tom Leopold, seven or eight years old, watching oh, television? Jonathan Winters. My brother and I would sit on the carpeting in front of the hi-fi and play his records, his nightclub records, endlessly. I would do them at school, the, the riffs and everything. So on the Steve Allen show, that was another great thing. Johnny Winters was going to be on. And when I heard that, and then Steve says to me, hey, Tom, you know, he's a genius, but I'm going, I want you to stick with him all day. So he doesn't just walk off, <laughs> walk <laughs> off a lot or something. So all day long, I'm, and he was sitting with Jonathan Winters, and he's doing bits for me alone. <laughs> anyway, lunch time, time comes, and I don't want to like, impose. He says, well, what are you doing for lunch? You want, you want to go to Musso Frank's? And I go, yeah. On the way back, he says, well, tell me about you. Do you have a family? What's your family? I said, well, I'm one of four boys and four brothers. And actually, my brother, Mark, my older brother, is in the hospital. My older brother had cancer. He's in the hospital. He goes, oh, he says, cancer. Okay. okay, when we get there, you call him, get him on the phones. We get to the, uh, we get to the oh. back to rehearsal. And I say, okay, John, we need you. No, he goes, wait a minute. No, no, no. So we go into his dressing room. I call my brother long distance at Mount Sinai, Mount, Cedar, Mount Sinai, I guess, in Miami Beach. And I say, Mark, some, a friend of mine wants to say hello to you. And Johnny got on with him. My brother's in the hospital room. Did like 15 minutes. Mark, this is Coach Anderson. You gotta get back in the team. We need you to play halfback, boy. You know, he couldn't get out of these. I mean, and he did, for my, he did that for my brother. And I'm, so, I mean, to me, uh, special place in heaven for him. But there's a special place in heaven for Jonathan Winters anyway. A, a few years ago, you you had a, an, I don't know if it's an epiphany or you had some sort of realization that you wanted to start following Christ. My parents only joined a synagogue to audition for the shows. <laughs> No kidding. So if Temple Beth Am was doing My Fair Lady, my, the, the temple, they joined this temple to, because they heard there was an open call at the temple to do My Fair Lady as a fundraiser. So they loved show business. That was their religion, right? So anyway, I came to convert through uh, these kind of a little supernatural, miracle-y things during a very rough time, uh, illness in my family. My, one of my kids was ill. Uh, thank God, did, everything is good now. But anyway, so I say to Paul, you know, I'm going to convert to Catholicism. And he, like all my friends, because they knew kind of what we were going through, and, and they were just happy, found something. And so Paul says, I've got to throw you a Tom Leopold's very last day as a Jew roast. So we rented Sammy's Romanian restaurant, the whole top floor, had a band, and I was roasted like a roast at the Friars Club. And Paul's opening line was, you know, everybody, Billy Persky was there, Loudon Wainwright, God, who else? Harry Shearer came as a, in full costume as a Hasidic rabbi, <laughs> full hat, everything. And he, Tommy, Tumbler, this is an intervention. 
He's trying to talk me out of being, leaving the Jews. You know? Paul's opening line was to everybody, <clears throat> isn't this great? Isn't this amazing? Isn't this wild? Does Tom Leopold know how to abandon his people or what? <laughs> and you and then, yeah. Jerry Foley. And then everybody came up and, and, and tortured me. It was wonderful. It was one of the most beautiful nights of my life. I have seen you do your one person show about yeah, your Yeah, I do a whole show about it, yeah. To, uh, Called The Comedy Writer Finds God. You did this. I'm available for your church, your <laughs> Elks Club. You, you're, you're, I'll appear in your panic room. <laughs> I want to point this out. Two things. One, you performed this for the, the, the students at Columbia, and they absolutely Yeah, I've done it all it. over the country, yeah. And I want to also point out, this was something completely it's funny. different. It's funny, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. We were in Brooklyn. You didn't know that I was going to be there supporting my friend. This was a couple months ago. Hipsters in the audience. Tom Leopold gets up in front of all these 20-something hipsters, and you were interviewed for probably 15 or 20 minutes and killed with these 20-year-old... <laughs> Uh, you know, they... they, they the band, really, especially. A special, you always want to kill with the band, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. every... I mean, the the deafening laughter in that room uh, in Brooklyn... Surprised I, I me, mean, yeah. No, it did not surprise me, because I, I think if you got your peers... I, I know I would say you're a comedy genius, and all your other peers would be, too. But mm. to take uh, someone, like, a long career like that in front of an audience like that, which are th th not always the easiest, and kill... What I'm saying is, is that you've had this journey in comedy and in show business. You've been such an inspiration to me. Oh, you were so nice when you, I was starting Mark. out thank on you. television. I remember. Well, you're you're great. Oh, you're Obviously. very. That's very very. But you know, it's, I I I hey, I, this sort of thing where people sort of tell me this sort of thing now. Believe me, it's great. I love it. You know, but nobody knows who. I, I mean, you're a writer. You know, nobody knows. But it's it's nice to see that guys your age and stuff and women. Uh, know who a little bit of uh, sort of followed the writers that's a really big thrill for me oh wow I'm, it was a career wasn't it you know at the time you're just going oh god i better get another job this leads to that that leads to that this leads to nothing you know <laughs> and uh you look back and you go wow I've, it's it's a really beautiful feeling you have knowledge you have skills that you are passing on to uh, another generation and you have this kindness about oh. you and a, a gentleness and <laughs> just you, you. God you. gave you so many gifts and for you to pass that on to another generation is a gift. Tom Leopold, uh, you know, you, you were kind enough to, to ask me to, 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 to do this and uh, you were very much like, I, I, I feel bad asking. This was a privilege and ah. an honor to do, to sit down with you. Anytime I see Tom Leopold, on, on the phone, if I'm having uh, maybe a bad day, I, I immediately... Ah, come over here, I'm going to hold you. Face. Come on, I'm going to hold you. you. Yes. Let me hold yes. you. Let me hold you. <laughs> Marky. This is... Marky. I, I hope you play you some... My I hope you play some inspirational music over that in post. But Thank you. you. You've been such a pal to so, so many people. You go back to... Uh, the respect of your peers, which beyond, I mean, Ugh. to make people like Steve Allen, Mary Tyler Moore, and Jonathan Winters, all these people in Chevy Chase, uh, the funniest people on the planet, laugh. Yeah. It says something yeah. about you. Uh, it's, uh, it's been a great ride. It's and probably it's, over now. No, not over. What do you think? No, never. Okay. Not over. I can't okay. wait to see what's next. And I'll okay. be in the front row. Tom Leopold. Thank you all so right, much, pal. sir. Thanks, pal.